have Gary Jacobs here today. Uh, Gary is an alum of UC San Diego. He was a management science student here. Uh, he applied that effort well. He's done a number of things in the business community that have been really successful. What's most interesting for a lot of us here is that he was a real uh, founding force behind High Tech High, which a lot of people know through various connections. I know uh, several people in our design community have you know kids that go there, friends that teach there, all sorts of stuff. And what really struck me about High Tech High when Carol and I and others visited this spring uh, is that the space of High Tech High uh, feels um, a lot more like a design studio than it does like a classroom. And it's a, so it's a really kindred space for a lot of us. It was originally going to be just one school, but uh, they were far too successful. And so now there's this entire network of schools. And uh, I'll let Gary tell you that story. It's really just awesome to see. A fun fact that I learned just recently is that in addition to Gary's work in entrepreneurship and as an educational innovator, uh, he is also the owner of a minor league baseball team, the Lake Elsinore Storm. So if you want to get some good seats, thank you very much. Thank you very much. The uh, good and bad thing about owning a minor league baseball team affiliated one is that I actually have nothing to do with the players. I don't have to pay them, which is one thing, they're all Padre employees, but it's whoever they send us. And the team this year stunk. Um, so I think we finished last in both halves of our season. And uh, so, but interesting, again, in minor leagues, people don't actually come to see the game, they come to have a good family time. So I'd say about 60% of our fans actually have no idea what the final score was when they walk out, but they had a good time and they want to come back. Um, so that's minor league sports is very interesting in that sense. Um, I think we sort of followed our major league parent in how we played this year. Hopefully we'll both be better next year. Um, so high tech high, and I guess the abstract I gave was how do we design a student centered school um, as opposed to one of, I think what we all went to, or a lot of us went to a traditional high school or even the K-12 education. Um, high tech high was actually brought about by the business community here in San Diego. Back in 1999, we were all thinking about how do we attract qualified employees here to San Diego because we needed more engineers, technicians, and so on. And when people want to move here, one of the things they think about is, how are my children going to be educated? Is it going to be a good education system here or a bad education system here? What's the quality going on? In addition to things like housing costs and transportation and quality of life and so on. Um, so out of this education piece, we, the business community, were looking to see around the world what was going on. And again, part of this is because our university partners, including UCSD, were saying they were spending the, the freshman year teaching skill sets that they thought students should come out of high school with. We, as the business community, were spending a lot of money teaching these skill sets we thought students coming out of high school or university should have. Um, and so we wanted to say, we wanted to create an institution that would teach these skill sets and including the academic fundamentals that obviously you need. Um, so we looked around the world to see what different models were out there. And in particular, in Denmark, they have three different types of high schools. They have your traditional academic high school um, for getting into university and college. They have a technical high school, which has that strong academic focus, but also how do you actually apply those academics and a traditional vocational school. And so what they found looking at their university students was the students that came out of that technical high school in the middle were actually doing much better. And so we looked at that model and said, OK, that's great. That's what we want. And why are those students doing better? Because they were in teams working together. They learned how to problem solve. They learned how to communicate. And, and they were more than willing to keep learning because they were engaged in the learning. And it wasn't me setting up here talking to you, but we were actually having, you were doing projects to learn all this stuff. Um, and so then we, as this community, this, this group of uh, about 40 different people from different industries and different companies around San Diego said, OK, that's what we want, because those are the skill sets that we need. And of course, now we as a business people have actually no idea how to write a curriculum. So then we turned to the education community and said, OK, how are we going to do this? We want this school to be a student-centered school, because that's what it's all about. 
Um, obviously, we need adults in the classrooms to, to facilitate and to teach and so on. But it's, again, it's all about how do we get the student to be in an environment where they can do the best that they can do. Um, so this group of 40 again met. We looked at that. We actually were trying to figure out, were we just going to be <clears throat> a consulting to San Diego Unified? And for those of you who don't know it, San Diego Unified is the second largest school district in the state of California and the eighth largest school district in the United States. And also it's reasonably transient because we have all the Navy and military personnel there here in San Diego. Um, and so we wanted to have a way that we could actually affect San Diego Unified, change some of their practices, and get better education out of it. Also, uh, those of you who have applied to the UCs and gotten in, you know that there's this thing called the A to G requirements, which is the minimum standards of years of math, years of science, years of English, and so on, to actually apply to a UC or a, or a, a state university. And unfortunately, in California, only about 30% of students are actually getting those A to G requirements fulfilled in their high schools now. So they're not they're automatically not eligible to come to one of these schools. So we want to make sure that was part of uh, part of our curriculum and actually part of our graduation requirements. And then second, an awful lot of time you go, you're in high school, now you're supposed to go to college, now you're supposed to decide your career at 18, what you're going to do now for the rest of your life. Um, but a lot of students don't know that. And actually, if you look around the world, university students are probably typically older than they are here in the U.S. And so, but, so how can we give a U.S. student an opportunity to, to actually get into business and see what's going on? So in our junior year, we actually have them going out for a month out of the classroom into a business, understanding what the business world is all about. Half the time they decide whatever it is they got their internship in, they don't really want to do, which is perfectly fine. And half the time they're in there saying, wow, this is great. This is what I really want to concentrate on. Um, so again, it's about how do we get the school set up so that the student is at the center. And sometimes that's difficult. Um, because a lot of times the faculty are there saying, you know, well, how can you make an accommodation for me because I need to do this or do that. And so we occasionally have our debates about, okay, let's again go back to what the premise is. How is it a student-centered organization? So we, as I say, the business community is, is looking at this and these skill sets. And then at the same time, there was a group of educators that had gone around the country looking at 24 different urban high schools and find out what worked there in those different high schools. Uh, they were not excited about what they found, uh, except for a few design principles that they brought forward. And as it turned out, when we were talking to these educators, the design principles that we had found as the business community matched up very well with the design principles that they had found looking at these urban high schools. So one of them is uh, individualization. So we want to make sure, again, that the student is actually at the center. We want to make sure that the faculty knows who the student is, what the issues are, um, for those of you, again, who went to a traditional high school, I think, you know, there's seven periods. Everybody has a different schedule. There's an issue in one class. You have no idea who to go talk to about that issue um, and actually make it better and help the student. So we were saying, okay, we're actually going to create an environment where it's a smaller class, the teachers know who the student is, and that they actually have the same two teachers the entire time and then plus a couple of specialty teachers. But again, their main teachers are math, science, and humanities so that the, these teachers can work together, do joint projects, cross the, spe cross the uh, different principles, and then, um, and then again, see if there's an issue. At the same time, what we wanted to do was, if all of you remember your guidance counselor in high school, I saw mine the first day of high school in, seventh, in ninth grade, and I saw him the last day in high school in 12th grade. Maybe that means I was a good student and never got in trouble, but there wasn't a whole lot of guidance going on. Um, and so what we did is every faculty member is actually an advisor to 10 to 12 students across grades. And so the students pass on and, and can see what's going on with different grades. The seniors are teaching the culture to the freshmen. The sophomores are watching the juniors go through their SATs. The juniors are watching the seniors go through their college applications. And they're all talking and, and working with each other. And at the same time, those advisors are going out to a student's home at least once to find out what non-school issues are affecting their ability to learn. So do they not have the proper technology, access to the internet? Are there you know, three or four generations in a one-bedroom home? And how do they get space in order to study? How do they get the ability to um, find time to actually learn? What's the education background of the parent? 
um, and so on. So how do you actually um, see that and know what we need to deal with in the school? Because we believe that if you're in the school, it's our responsibility to provide the resources needed to make that to have that student actually succeed. And the way we do that to get our student body is we do a, a um, lottery. We want a student body that is high academic, high socioeconomic, low academic, low socioeconomic, because frankly, out in the real world, you don't get to be sitting in high academic, high socioeconomic the rest of your life. It's just not going to happen if you're in the business community. You've got people from all different backgrounds, and you need really to have the ability to, to work with everybody, to understand everybody. And as I like to say in a teen program that we run, to understand each other's story so that you know what's coming from when things happen. And also, frankly, if you're in business or you're in the university, you don't always get to work with people you like. Sometimes you have to work with somebody you don't like, but you still have to get the job done. And so how do we do that? Um, and so we just do little, we look at zip code data across the community. And we look at the number of school age children that are in the census and that zip code area. And that's how we base our student body. So it's a simple lottery. It's a one page application. We just look to see where you live. And then we don't really care where you're coming from from an academic point of view because we don't necessarily trust what, where you come from and what the grading standards were there. What kind of, uh, you know, was the honors course there the same as the honors course there? Was, and, and so on. So we'd rather just get you into the school and then we will work with you to get us into our methodology. Um, so last year we had about 8,000 applications for about 500 places. So we're teaching you how to apply to a UC right there. <laughs> um, and the UC system is almost a lottery, if you think about it, because everybody is roughly the same by the time they apply here with their GPA, their SAT scores and everything else. And then it's sort of like the admission officer I like that essay today that'll go on this pile. I didn't like that essay today that goes in that pile. Same person the next day goes the other direction, so who knows. I'm actually glad I'm not applying to a UC anymore. I would never get in. Um, so, that, so that's what we're doing uh, to get them in the classroom. That's how we're doing to support them in terms of, well, again, what they need in order to learn and what resources we need to provide them in order to succeed. Uh, the second part is adult world immersion. Part of that, again, is the internship I talked about. Part of that is um, bringing people into the school to talk about why the education that they had was important to what they do now. Again, try and match up this education that they're having to what they're going to eventually use it for uh, later on down the road. And also, when we hire faculty, we have the students involved in that process as well. So our current faculty does the first screening. The school directors do the second screening. We bring them in to teach in our environment for a day, and the students actually interview the potential teachers at lunch. And their comments are part of that hiring process. So they feel invested in it, and while you would think that students might decide to pick their favorite out of that, they're actually the comments they provide are very, very detailed. They're very deep because they understand that if they say this teacher should be here, they're going to be stuck with that teacher with it here. So they want to, <laughs> they want to make sure it's somebody that, that they'll enjoy learning from. The other thing uh, about that is that, again, with the internships, we send them out there. And um, we have a constant stream of people coming through. We had about 5,000 visitors to our schools last year um, coming through. So the students actually learn how to deal with the distraction of people coming through uh, the schools. Our schools are wide open so that the architectural is all about visual control. There's, you can see what's going on uh, throughout the classrooms. You can see what's going on in the hallways. And so if somebody's walking by or 10 people are walking by in a group, you'll notice them walking by and you have to understand how to keep your concentration on what you're doing. Or if you happen to be out in the classroom, out in the hallway working in a small group, a lot of times this group of adults is walking by, the students will actually say, would you like to hear about what I'm doing? So we want, we get them that confidence to actually work, do that presentation right there. And if you're wandering around and look a little lost, a student will actually help you figure out where you're supposed to go. Um, the third part then is common intellectual mission. Again, we want the teachers working together, our faculty working together, so that projects aren't just a math project or a history project or uh, an art project. So the teachers, how do, they, how do they create a project that brings that together? So one of the art projects we had was Calculicious. So the students actually had to use calculus form or formulas in order to actually create the art. Um, and so there's some very fascinating stuff that came out on student artwork. 
when you come down to the school, and I don't say if, when you, if you come to school, but when you come to the school and see it, uh, you'll see student art all over the place because we want to make sure, again, it's all about the students. I think we had two pieces of non-student art when we started. One is now down. The other one is in the, one of our main conference rooms, and it's basically brain neurons, so we remind the faculty that actually have to think about what they're doing. Um, and the students, obviously, when, they, when they're there, too. One of the other projects that we just recently completed was a giant wheel, and they had to use physics and understand mechanics in order to create the gears on there. But each piece that's in there is, is about history. So they had to pick a time of history and understand how, that, how civilization in that time frame worked. Did it, did it succeed? Did it, did it last? And what issues came up? So they had to actually combine, again, the humanities, the history, the math, and the physics on, on how you created this wheel. And it's actually pretty amazing to watch it all work and what different student groups did on it. Um, so uh, again, we want to have this common intellectual mission where faculty are working together with each other. And it's not just a silo over here and a silo over there. Um, and in fact, as, we, as you talked about design work, and we talk about what's going on at UCSD right now, there's a lot of those silos breaking down. It's all about collaboration and how do we get different um, disciplines to work with each other because there's great synergy when doing that as opposed to everybody doing their own thing. And also, frankly, there's limited resources, financial and otherwise, in order to do things. And if you work together, you get a much better use out of those resources. Um, so the school has now been going uh, since 2000, or the, school, uh, the first one. Uh, started in 2000. We now have five high schools, four middle schools, four elementary schools, and three different campuses. We are now going to uh, actually do a fourth campus up in Claremont um, that the school district sold to us. Don't ask me why school districts are selling assets to pay operations. Not a good idea if you're in management science. Um, but, uh, but they did, and so we got it. So we will be developing that as well. What we found with our students as they come out of the school and coming to universities are, they're obviously able to study no matter where, what commotion is going on around them. And so therefore, uh, while their peers have to actually go find someplace quiet, they can study anywhere. They're more likely to talk to their professors and get and, and make that connection because they're so used to having that connection at the high school level. And um, they actually can make a presentation. Uh, we have four children. Two of them went to our traditional school in the neighborhood, Torrey Pines, which is actually a high academic performing high school. And then two of them went through the high tech high system. And the two younger ones when they went to college said, what were these students doing in high school? They can't talk. They can't present. They don't know how to work in teams. And these are all skills that we as the business community and you as the university community, uh, community frankly, would like to see because that's really the best way to teach students um, as opposed to doing this kind of frontal instruction. Um, some of the issues we do have is that the students coming out of our school are so used to being engaged and then they get into uh, the university and the first thing they get is a 600 student biology lecture. <laughs> and the professor's down there someplace, a little dot, um, and there's no interaction going on. And so they actually, uh, so we have to teach those skills a little bit in seniors, in their senior year in order for them to do that. Um, and be able to handle that. Uh, and obviously, and so one of the other things that we do uh, in the school is that the teacher is not the educator. So it's not me saying, I am the font of all content. I am the font of all knowledge. I will tell you, and you will learn what I know. And then you will tell me back that you memorized what I know, and now you know. Um, these days, frankly, content is everywhere. It's on the internet. It's uh, much more up to date than what I learned in college. So if I'm going to teach you what I know, that's not going to do you any good because it's, there's something more important or, or different that's out there now. And it could actually be completely different from what I learned. And several things that we've seen in recent years where the, the truth was one way, and then the more research has shown that it's actually exactly the opposite. Um, and so we want to make sure that the students actually have the ability to go out, find original source material validate and verify that material, because as we all know, everything on the internet is true. Um, and then, of course, be able to actually use it to do something. Um, and if, when you walk through the schools, you will see that students are not in the classroom most of the time. They're out in small groups, in the hallways, in study areas, working together to solve the problem of, or solve the assignment or whatever it is. Uh, we were talking today a little bit earlier about peer review. 
So the students are actually working with each other, reviewing uh, what each other is writing or the project they're working on. And, then, and that actually helps, of course, learn for yourself to do better. Uh, we do not track the students. So if you're in ninth grade math, you're in ninth grade math. If you want to do honors, you're just doing more work within the same classroom. So it's harder on the teacher, in a sense, because they have to deal with a wider range of academic background in there. But the students at the lower end of the academics see the students at the higher end as role models. And of course, we can then use the students at the higher end as tutors to help the other students as well to bring them up to speed. And frankly, then you get away from the smart class and the dumb class, and so you get away from somebody not feeling like they can achieve because they're in the dumb class. And so when I talk about Torrey Pines, for instance, as an academic powerhouse, because they have all these great AP classes and everybody's doing great work, well, it's part of the integration. You bring in uh, the busload of kids from Southeast San Diego, and all of a sudden they're taking all the regular classes and the local neighborhood white kids are taking all the AP classes and while the school is integrated, <clears throat> they're both sitting at opposite ends of the lunch court, not interacting with each other, not getting the same education in the school, and maybe on the sports teams is where they actually go and see each other, but in the classrooms they don't. And unfortunately, there's a big difference between the AP teacher and the regular class teacher. Our son had a chemistry teacher in regular chemistry who said, well, I got to see in chemistry in college, that's good enough for you in this class. And frankly, what he was teaching was wrong a lot of the time, so we actually had, they actually finally fired him brought in another teacher to do it, and then another high school hired him. So we have to watch out for that. But inside our school, teachers are on one-year contracts. There's no tenure. Um, if they can't, they have a lot of autonomy in their classroom to get to where they're supposed to be, but they also have a lot of accountability in the, in, at the same time. We don't do a whole lot of tests, uh, multiple choice tests. It's all about project-based learning. How do you actually demonstrate that you understand and have learned what you're working on, and it can be done in a variety of ways. Our daughter, youngest daughter um, had an assignment where they were actually doing uh, camping, and they were building stoves and a variety of other things to learn about uh, physics and chemistry and so on. And she said, well, I'm not really into that, but I really like to do it by doing the video of this. And so she actually videoed the whole thing, created the film on it, learned the skills she needed to learn at the same time, but just did it in a different way with the rest of her peers in the, in the classroom and out on the camping trip and, and so on. So you try and find a way, again, to make it student-centered, say, this is, we can work with each individual student and create and design a way that they will be the most likely to succeed, which is the name of a movie about the school, if you ever get a chance to see it. The one thing missing in it is me, but that's a different story. Um, the, uh, but it talks about the fact that um, how do you actually do these different skill sets and how, and how are things different now. Uh, one of the things they talk about is the gentleman who went on to play Deep Blue in Jeopardy, or Watson in Jeopardy, actually, and uh, Watson beat him. Um, uh, but he thought it wouldn't happen because of all the different uh, things that Jeopardy does to fool you on their questions. And in fact, the computer was actually able to parse those and beat him in that. Uh, there's actually an interesting commercial out there right now where he's back talking to Watson about IBM these days. Um, the other thing is if you look at a lot of research reports that are going on, uh, those are actually generated by computer as well. They can actually parse all the different information and actually write a paragraph that you would think was actually written by a human, but is actually written by the computer. And if computers can do all that, what do we as humans have to do that's different uh, that the computer cannot yet do? Doesn't mean they will never be able to do it, but for now they can. And so again, this is about how do we look ahead, how do we create, how do we find the problems and solve the problems using technology as a tool but not as uh, the final say-so. So in one of the discussions we were just talking about was what, is, what are the careers going to be in 20, 25 years, 30 years from now, and how do you teach to those careers? And my answer to that really is you don't actually teach to the career anymore because we don't know what the skill, we don't know what the content needed for that um, job will be, that career will be, but you teach the skills in order to learn how to get the information, parse the information, use the information, and come out with whatever end, end product that you need there. And that's what we're trying to teach our high-tech high kids. Um, and I find it fascinating to walk into these classrooms because then I remember back in my classroom in high school where I'm sitting there doing the worksheet and knowing somebody sat in this chair the year before doing the same thing and they're going to sit there a year after doing the same thing and what's the relevance to my future life. And we want them, 
want our students to understand relevance to what's going to happen in their, um, in their careers. Uh, another thing that um, happened in the, uh, in the movie is that it was interesting that they had a group of high school students and they talked to them and said, what would you like out of your high school experience? And, the, uh, and you know, one option was, well, I need to, do, need to learn the skills, or I need to learn the facts, be able to put them out on my SAT or on my SAT2 or whatever it is they had to take because I need to, that's what I need to do to get into the best university. Or it could be I need to learn these skill sets that will help me in the university, may not get me in um, the traditional way, and, but they're lifelong learning opportunities. And a lot of the high school students, even the brightest ones, said, oh, I just need to get in the best university. That's all I care about right now. So we have to change the mindset a little bit about as well with, the, with our students. Um, we do require everybody to uh, get accepted to a college or a university. That's part of the graduation requirements. They don't necessarily go because of financial or cultural issues, but they are accepted um, there, again, as part of our requirements. So um, we like that. Uh, it's about 97% because we do have some special ed students that obviously aren't going to have that opportunity necessarily uh, for a variety of reasons and um, that. But it's very interesting when I shake the 600 and something hands of all the seniors on the different graduations to ask them where they're going, what they're interested in. Um, based on what they've learned there, and they all seem very excited about, about going on to the university. Um, and, uh, and again, what we believe is that every student has a different learning style. How do we actually find that right learning style for the students so they can, again, actually uh, do the best that they can, which is what we're really, really interested in in that sense. We've now started a graduate school of education. It only took us eight years to get accredited by WASC. Um, for those of you who have been on committees here, I'm sure you love that bureaucracy. But it was very interesting because we had to do a couple of things. One is we had to understand what a real research graduate school was all about, uh, which I think was part of the time it took, but also was a great learning experience for us as the adults. But at the same time, we had to train and educate the WASC community about um, that we're different. Because they have a very cookie cutter model which says if you're a graduate school, this is what you're going to do and they kind of check off their list. Okay, good, you did it, you're fine. And we're saying, no, we don't do it that way. Uh, we do it a different way. This is how we're going to do it. We're going to still get out great research. We're going to still get out great graduate students with a great master's degree. But we're going to do it in a different way. And so it took us a while to get <clears throat> the education process going to them, getting the right group of people to... Uh, to actually review us and understand what we're doing and then, and then finally give us the accreditation this past summer. So we're happy about that. We can give a master's degree in classroom leadership and one in school leadership. It can be a one-year residency program or a two-year part-time program. And every student, that's in, every student that's actually in the master's program has a project they have to complete, a year-long project they have to complete uh, based on uh, whatever their passion is. So one of our teachers who's now actually doing her academic credential is talking is working on the alumni program with my wife Darianne who's out there in the back. She's out here. Just in case I forget to say something, she'll remind me about what part of the school I didn't I didn't uh, talk about. Um, and so she's working on that and several other teachers are actually working on different projects as well. Now change in the uh, K-12 environment does not necessarily have to be driven by the principal and the teachers. We actually had a group of teachers that came from one of the schools down in Southeast San Diego, down by the border, um, and they just heard about randomly about the grad school. They came up to the information session. They both got accepted. And one of the things that we had to do is a lot of exhibitions of student work for the community, for the parents, and for other teachers that are in the, in the neighborhood or whatever. And so they went back down to their school and they did an exhibition of their student work. And the students that were in a different classroom with a different teacher said to their teacher, when's our exhibition time? And so again, we can have a ground, uh, ground up, uh, bottom up uh, piece of how do we actually change our schools because the students want to have, have change at the same time. Um, and so, you know, like I say, we're, we're doing a, I think we're doing a great job in terms of, of changing the methodology in K-12 education. Um, doing a lot of reform work. We also do a lot of work in Israel right now, uh, bringing it into the Israeli school system. Um, and we're seeing that uh, change happening over there. Um, 
my daughter, our youngest daughter, is actually uh, consulting with a charter high school in Ithaca right now. Um, I'm changing that, and she's a junior at Cornell, but she's so invested in the in the methodology and 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 in the passion about it that she's actually able to pass it on to teachers, uh, veteran teachers at the school, and help them change how they're how they're teaching. Um, and if you're ever low on energy, you can walk into our schools. The kids, it's exciting to see that energy coming out of students, as opposed to sometimes where it's like, uh, I don't want to go to school today. Let me figure out a way to to be sick. Uh, in our in our case, we actually have to remind the parents that their child is sick. Don't send them to school, please, because uh, they all want to be there. They all want to be. They actually want to come to school um, and work. Um, so hopefully uh, we're doing the <coughs> excuse me, Hopefully we're doing the right thing with our students, thinking about them, what they can do, how to get them to to think about uh, future life skills, future education skills, and actually want to keep learning and be invested in their in their university education or into their uh, career wherever however they're going. So thank you very much. Questions? Wonderful, I did such a great job. Nobody wants to ask me anything. Yes? I have a question. Uh, first of all, I just want to say I'm really impressed with like, all the different ways that you've really turned this into a high school education. Thank you. Uh, probably 10 things that you need to be careful about. <laughs> Okay. So the name High Tech High is a little bit of a misnomer. It's actually, it was the high tech community that was putting the school, talking about creating the school, and so it was our working name for the school. And then we get decided, oh, it's time to name it. What are we going to call it? So everybody threw out a bunch of names. And at the end of the day, we said, oh, let's just keep it High Tech High. So everybody thinks it's all about technology, which it, is, it really isn't. We are broad, we're a full spectrum school full liberal arts, everything else, that, that you need to have a well-rounded K-12 education. Um, so technology is just a tool there. Um, we use it, the kids can design video games in, in our lab, but the video game has to be educational in nature. And the only video game they get to play is ones they've actually written themselves. Um, <laughs> so uh, they're not out playing Mario Brothers or something like that. The, um, in the technology side, we want them to think about how to use technology for real-world problems. So for instance, there was a UC SD grad student whose project was how to collect CO2 data from the upper atmosphere to find out where it's coming from and then be able to go back and figure out how you're going to solve that. Our students were figuring out a low-cost way for him to get that equipment up into the upper atmosphere. Um, we had students originally in chemistry doing human-powered submarines to learn about fluid dynamics, and we beat quite a few college teams in the contest that we, do. we have robotics that the, in the first robotics program that they're learning about how to do that. Um, we had a group, including one of our daughters, that went to Tanzania to work with the park rangers there to understand how to create a DNA barcode system so that when a poacher is caught with the, whatever the meat is, you can actually figure out what it is. Because once you take the hooves and the skin off an animal, it's kind of hard to tell what it really was originally. Some people can smell it, apparently, and tell you what it is not really admissible in a court of law. So, create, so you create a DNA barcode or a DNA database, and so you can test it to find out what it really is. So we try and find out problems like that that they can use technology to, to uh, solve the problem. We don't actually teach to a technology because in, t in five years, who knows what it's really going to be, right? You know, we've gone from, uh, from big giant computers the size of this room to my, lap to my desktop to my laptop to my mobile device. Um, so who knows where it's going now. So we don't know what the technology will be then, but we want you to have the skills to understand when the change happens and what you're going to do with it. Um, so hopefully that answered the question. Yes? Um, so I, I don't agree with standardized testing, okay. given that it's so prevalent and like accurate records. Like right. Baby filter for so many stages. How do you guys train your students to do it? Yeah, so no child left behind is often referred to as no child left untested. Um, standardized testing is, is cultural based, unfortunately, so you got those sort of problems. We, for quite a while, said we don't really care about them. Um, unfortunately, the newspapers like to publish them. 
And so then people, well, your school's not doing well without looking at all the other measures of success that are really important, <clears throat> college admission rates, what they do after college, how um, do they get out of college in a reasonable amount of time? Are they still in, in a college or university? If they went into a career, what are they doing there? So now we've actually gone back a little bit and said, okay, we do have to do some work on these tests. Not that we're, we're not going to teach the test because that's not useful, uh, but we are going to teach the test-taking skills so that you do well on the test. Um, hopefully President Obama gets through some of the stuff he's talking about, reducing the amount of testing that happens, um, and, uh, and it'll move forward that way. Right now, it's kind of interesting, the whole system is in limbo because they had an annual uh, yearly performance uh, number, and if you're below that number, you got put on a watch list. Well, they actually stopped giving the test a couple years ago because they're changing it over the common core test. So you could actually never get out of, out of this limbo, out of this uh, watch list because you couldn't take the test to fix it. Um, and the way they had it set up was that a certain, uh, a certain level of proficiency got you to that. And then, you had, then the next year was higher, and the next year was higher, and the next year was higher. And if you think about it from a statistical point of view, you can actually never get to 100%. And so the whole thing was kind of messed up to, to start with. So we try and we, we do not do standardized. I mean, we do the standardized test you have to do because of the state and the feds and college admissions and so on. But we teach the skills to take the test, not teach to the test. Yes? Yes. So again, there's very little actual multiple choice tests and so on. A lot of writing gets done. Uh, the parent-teacher conference is actually led by the student themselves, so they reflect back on what they're doing. At the end of every semester, they have to do a presentation of learning about what they've learned during the semester and how they've mastered it, what issues they came up with, what opportunities they have for improvement, what they thought was actually done very well. And then at the end of the year, they actually have to do a transitional presentation of learning to say, yes, we've mastered the skills that uh, um, we think are important before you go on to the next grade. And so it's all about a lot of reflection. And it's not just the students doing the reflection. Teachers are doing self-reflection at the same time. Teachers are sitting in other teachers' classrooms working with them. Uh, veteran teachers are working with, with new teachers. Um, we do have a fairly young faculty. Um, and, so, uh, and so there's self-reflection going on all the time. Um, as Larry Rosenstock, our CEO, likes to joke, a teacher will claim they have 20 years of experience. What they really have is one year of experience repeated 19 more times, um, as opposed to changing things around every time and understanding where, where life is, uh, where content is moving, where the universe is moving, and so on. So we do have a lot of that reflection going on. Yes, back there. Uh, sir, you heard the old adage, there's a, there's a chicken can <laughs> Uh, I think part of it is by actually changing what you think of as a teacher. Our teachers aren't, I would call them teachers in the sense of standing up here giving a lecture, they're facilitators of the students. And so if you think of from that point of view, we can actually change the image of what, of what this teacher, is, what the teacher thinks and what people can do. <clears throat> I think you know, there's a lot of programs trying to get um, top students to become teachers, uh, not to let Qualcomm hire them. Um, although we like Qualcomm to have good, good employees and good engineers. Um, but how do, how do you do that? And there's a very interesting phenomenon going right now is that all these baby boomer teachers that came out of World War II are about to retire. And if you took every ed school in the country and every graduate they have, there's no way they're going to fill the back, backfill of those empty spaces. So how are we going to actually change the profession in order to have teachers going out there? Part of it may be online uh, courses. Part of it may be... Somehow the teacher is handling a broader base of students, um, but having some kind of TA system or something where there are actually others in the classroom doing it. Um, and some of it, again, if you go back to project-based learning, I think you actually can do it a, di a whole different way of teaching um, than you do, and you won't need as many teachers. You just need better teachers. Um, I think that uh, it's really changing the mindset of the country about if our, our students are the investment you want to make, 
so that when we get to this point, that the universities are getting the students that they want, and the industry is getting eventually the students that they, uh, the employees that they want. Um, so it's it's a challenge to it. <clears throat> pay would be a good thing. It would be nice if we could pay the teacher the same as Qualcomm pays an engineer. Um, I think that would help quite a bit. Um, but I'd be interested to see if there's ways to try and rotate corporate or, uh, engineers or corporate people into the classroom for a period of time because they're the ones that are at the forefront of trying to solve problems. They can bring real world problems into the classroom for the students to work on. Um, and I think that we would actually get the opportunity to see some of these top uh, employees or top students actually have the opportunity to teach. And they may at the end of the day say, you know what, it's a passion of mine. Um, I, think I'll move, I think I will move from the corporate world into the, into the K-12 world or into the academic world. We do have a couple of uh, teachers that moved from, one of them was a manager of uh, engineering at Motorola and now is in the classroom. He's been there for many years now. So he brings that kind of mentality back into, into the classroom that's not just, again, let's do the worksheet and get through it. Um, so that, that's one way I, I think we can do that. Um, uh, and also, frankly, it's convincing, just like we, the business community, started High Tech High because we needed the skill sets into, the, into, um, into our employee base. The minute that the community starts to see that their employee base is not available or not up to speed, because, uh, up to what the standards are that they need because the teaching uh, community is not what they need either, I think you'll see a whole, all of a sudden, a massive... Uh, uh, problem solving uh, thing done by, by the business community because at the end of the day, they're the ones that need the quality employees and the, the universities need quality academic people and, and so on. And so I think you'll see the business community all of a sudden wake up and realize that they need to focus in on, on teachers. Yes? So you mentioned there's a lot of collaboration in terms of like the bar group. Uh -huh. There would be collaboration in the bar group Right, so we actually have, um, we will work with our high school students who go down to the middle school and work with the middle school students and the middle school students who work with the elementary school students. Um, so we have that kind of collaboration going on. And in terms of a whole class collaboration, um, one of our teachers uses Greek tragedies. They have a play being done, so the whole class is doing that. But they take a, a Greek tragedy that's uh, written from the male perspective and change it into the female perspective. So the students actually have to do all that work and, cha and change it around. Um, so they're also thinking about what's going on. Um, we do have collaboration between different schools at times, depending on what they're doing. Um, we, at one point in time, had some of our humanities teachers actually recreating the Silk Road outside in, in the commons area. Um, so everybody had to work together to do that, for instance. Um, and then actually, from the high school to the university, we have collaboration going on, and we actually had a fruit fly study that was doing, being done here at UCSD, and our, actually our high school students actually did the initial work with the fruit flies at the high school level, <coughs> sent that research up to the university, and then the, the university professors obviously did what they were do doing in their research, got published in one of the major publications, and the high school students were referencing about their work that was done. Um, so that's great for them and for doing that. So we do try and to the small group part, but also then expand it out to the larger group. We had <clears throat> a project called Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Um, so the kids had to design a new product, build the prototype, write the marketing plan, write the business plan, and then present it all. And then the best of those we actually took to, we had a VC group come in and do it, and so we actually have three patents pending right now for things the kids designed, and we had to deal with them that if it makes money, we'll split the, we'll split the, <laughs> we'll split the revenue with them. So we'll see what happens. But, uh, Yes? Um, how do you determine how well a student interacted to learn an individual con concept from student to student? And also, <coughs> post school, after each student, once they've gone on uh, and left the program? Uh, from in, inside the classroom, when they're in, in our environment, we don't, we, there are some tests that are given, but the primary way, uh, primary way is how can they present and tell us what they've learned, and are they uh, from, have they learned what the concept is they need. And they show it via a project, they show it via some writing they've done, they show it during the presentation they give. So a variety of different ways that we're looking to find out, has the student mastered the, the fundamental 
item that, that we need them to do. Um, when they leave High Tech High, that's what Joanna is working on right now, the alumni program, we actually do go back and look at data to see how they're doing in, in their university or in their career. So for instance, our students, I think it's 78% of them, have either graduated college or are still college within a six year period. Um, our students go into or actually graduate, 30% of them graduate with a STEM major. The average is about 15% coming in with a STEM major and then not uh, outside of our system. Coming in 15% and not necessarily graduating with a STEM major. Um, and a variety of other measures that we do look at to see how we're doing. Um, it's not always easy because the information that's collected isn't always what we need to see. So we've actually, our research in our graduate school, a lot of it is about how do we look and see what we're doing. Um, <clears throat> actually found some of the paperwork from the discussions we had in this 40 person group, whatever it is now, uh, 18 years ago, and what, what goals we had. So I went back to look at that to see how we're doing. And the one goal we need to measure still very well is are the, all our students having gone to university, are they coming back to San Diego to work in industry here? So that's one of the things we need to take a look at. Yes? We actually did a study to see who, who talked to who when they had an, had an issue. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see from the, uh, the students asking them, were they more likely to go to, uh, was a white student more likely to talk to a Latino student if they had an issue? Did they perceive them as being smart? Um, and vice versa, who went to who? And actually, when you present the data to the students, they go, oh, wow, that's very interesting. I'm going to change my behavior pattern. Um, and so they do. You actually see them changing who they're talking to, who they're working with. Uh, we like to say that we've only had two fights at High Tech High in the entire time we've been together. And one of those was two students in the stall in the girls' bathroom, so it was fairly well contained. Uh, <laughs> uh, and one student was out in the parking lot talking to another student and said, I'd punch you out, but we don't do that here at High Tech High. Um, but they're teenagers, so we have a variety of teenage issues that go on anyway. Um, but we're a school of choice also, so that we can say, hey, you're not living up to our norm. Uh, we're going to suspend you or expel you, or you should withdraw because that way, go back to your other institution, change your behavior pattern, and then reapply. So there's always a carrot at the end of that stick to say, come on back. <clears throat> and a lot of times the students would do that, realize what they're missing and, and change whatever they need to do to come back. The, um, our small groups with the, academic, with the faculty advisors also helps in that sense too, again, because everybody's passing down with their knowledge of the school. And because we don't have the dumb versus smart kids, everybody's working together in that same classroom, they're actually working together in groups too and starting to recognize that, hey, we can actually, everybody can actually do the work here some need a little more help, some need a little less help, but at the end of the day, in the group, people are working together, creating this, creating an environment that you, you can uh, break down these social barriers that, that normally happen. Yes? So you talked about Um, we actually <coughs> do a lot of consulting with some of those areas about how can you, how can you do that. Um, at the end of the day, we're, we, are ha we are, have the good luck of having a good business community around us. But if the school, the, if the principal, the, the teachers, and the, and the students want to change, they don't need the business community to do it. Um, they can make that change. And in any community, there's got to be, a, there are adult role models to take a look at. Um, regardless of how rural you are, there is somebody out there that's, that's a role model. And so how do you bring them into the school um, in order to, to show what they've done, why they needed the education, and how they did it? Um, and then, you know, if that school is doing well, people will, flock to, people will come to it. So while we get 5,000 people through our schools every year, there are more schools being developed along our, our uh, philosophy, and people are starting to go to those schools as well. It's uh, interesting that there are several schools now in San Diego with the basic high-tech, high philosophy, changed, based, you know, little tweaks of what they want to do. So now we actually have competition, which is good for us too, because then we'll stay on our toes and, and move forward. Um, 
but I think even in, even in an area where you don't have such a concentration of business as we do here, you can still create that kind of change. Great. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. You are all invited down to the school, please, uh, or schools. Please let us know uh, if you'd like to come down so we make sure you're there when the students are there. Um, and our student ambassadors would be more than happy to take you around and tell you all about it. <laughs>